that we've seen during this debate go around the country, either to their parishes or in other forms, and say, as they are saying, that we think nuclear use of nuclear weapons is wrong, and some of them are saying, in fact, we see no way that nuclear weapons should ever be used. Isn't that going to have an influence on the debate? Well, is it really? Is there anyone that really favors using those weapons or that wants to see them? Our own proposals in START and INF are aimed at starting to reduce those weapons, and my own hope is that maybe once we start, that we can completely eliminate them. The, what we're talking about is a, is a weapon that is so contrary to what used to be, uh, before Hitler invented total war, what used to be the policy of all nations by way of the uh, Geneva uh, rules and regulations concerning warfare, and that is that you did not make uh, civilians targets of war. We used to have very specific rules about that in the rules of warfare. And then came total war in World War II, and I'm, yes, all of the nations finally were, were doing it with the conventional weapons, bombing and so forth. But this now, can anyone, granted that your weapons are targeted on weapons, but this kind of weapon can't help but have an effect on the population as a whole. So they aren't saying anything we don't say that, uh, God forbid, those weapons should ever be used. Mr. President, Mr. President what? I'm saying that based on what you've seen so far, there's nothing inconsistent in the bishop's letter with uh, your administration's policies? Well, as I say, I have not seen it yet, and 45,000 words are a lot to digest. Um, but what I'm saying is that I think their purpose is the same as ours. They're looking for a way uh, toward peace and promoting world peace, and that's what we're also looking for. And um, I think to just deal in the specifics, and so far, uh, all of the accounts of this and all of the reporting is dealt on that one word, as if uh, the difference between curb and halt. Um, we, we've had some indications that in reality there are many things in there that we'll have no quarrel with at all. Mr. President, uh, Soviet leader Andropov yesterday made a new offer in the medium-range missile talks. Do you see anything positive in what he called for yesterday? Well, yes. The very fact that they have moved toward um, uh, discussing warheads instead of missiles. Uh, we, we feel that way and have felt that way for some time, that this is, uh, this is what we should be negotiating. And uh, we're going to give this serious consideration, uh, as we do any proposal that they make. And I will be talking to Dr. Nitzer before he returns to the INF talks about this. And uh, I can't go beyond that now in uh, uh, giving any indication. What about the fact that he continues to uh, want to include the British and the French missiles, the fact that he's not talking about Soviet missiles in Asia? Well, this is, as I say, this is going to take careful consideration to see where it figures in with what we're trying to accomplish in those meetings. And I can't go beyond it because then you get into the very area of talking about negotiations, and you, you can't do that in advance. Mr. President, I was wondering, the administration has initially seemed to characterize what Andropov said uh, as less than sweeping in terms of uh, the changes that he's offered. But I was wondering whether you felt, based on what you've seen, read, and heard, whether uh, this seemed to you like a sincere effort on his part to uh, break the impasse, or whether it was just another chapter in the propaganda back and forth. Well, this will, this will be determined, I think, when the negotiators get back there and, um, and are actually at the meetings. But as I say, the encouraging thing was that he made a proposal, and it was a proposal that aimed at something that has uh, been a consideration of ours, and that is that we should be negotiating warheads and not just missiles. Now, uh, you won't know until you really sit across the table from them uh, uh, whether he was whether this was just propaganda or a proposal. Are you, are you saying that you think this improves chances for an agreement this year? I can't put a time limit on. Remember, it took seven years to get the SALT agreement. 
Um, I can only say that the very fact that they're at the table and returning to the table is, is encouraging. Uh, to me, when you look back at the history all the way to the end of World War II, in attempting to get negotiations of this kind with them, that uh, we're encouraged by the fact that they are uh, there at the table and willing to, to discuss and have actually made a proposal of their own. Going back to Carl's question a second, uh, some of your aides have expressed the opinion that the f nuclear freeze movement may be on the wane. Do you share that view? Be on the wane? No, but I could express a hope that uh, I haven't given much consideration to uh, whether it is or is not. Uh, I hope it is because I think it's counterproductive. Uh, actually, uh, we're all talking a freeze, but we're talking something that is practical that if you once get down to a verifiable balance, they are talking and have been talking of a freeze even though there is a great imbalance which we think would increase the, the possibility of war if one side has too much of an advantage over the other. And so what we have said is reduce first and then freeze. And uh, we've always thought the fallacy in the freeze movement was they wanted to freeze first and then uh, see if you could reduce, but there wouldn't be any there wouldn't be any incentive for the Soviets with the margin of superiority they have uh, to, once they had a freeze, uh, to then uh, try, go for reductions. So uh, if, as you say, if the movement is on a wane, maybe they've begun, maybe many of them who I'm sure are quite sincere have seen the fallacy of that position. Mr. President, uh, moving on to another topic. Uh, before this session began, you asked why you shouldn't be scolding members of the uh, House committee that voted yesterday to uh, stop funding for overt operations uh, uh, against Nicaragua. Do you really see any consequences of that action? Does that vote stop you from doing anything or hinder anything your administration is doing? Well, that's in a, that's in a committee and there is a Senate yet to, uh, uh, to go on this. And I would hope that maybe we could do better there. The, it also, uh, had an element in it that looked at partisanship since the vote was on straight party lines. And uh, I don't believe that that reflects the thinking of a great many Democrats uh, because many of them spoke up right after my speech. Does this uh, vote indicate that you failed in your objectives in that speech? No, as I say, because I know that there are still a great many Democrats who've been quite outspoken, uh, including some of the leadership. Uh, in the House of their party um, in support of what I had proposed of making this a bipartisan approach and uh, even being critical of some of their members who did seem to sound partisan. The thing that, that needs telling about this whole situation in Nicaragua, I thought I had covered the subject but maybe I didn't cover it enough uh, the other night. And that is that the, right now, this, these forces that have risen up in opposition to the Sandinista government are under what you might say is a, is a, a sort of a group, a, a controlling body that formed in the northern part of Nicaragua. Uh, there are about seven leading members to this kind of committee. Most of them were former anti-Somoza people. They are people who simply want this government of Nicaragua to keep its promises. If you will remember the Organization of American States asked Somoza to resign at that time. And Somoza, his, re his reply to them was that if it would benefit his country, Nicaragua, he would, and he did resign. The Organization of American States also gave four points to the Sandinistas, that they, the Organization of American States, would support them if their goal was these four uh, things of promoting democracy, of uh, immediate elections, of a concern for human rights. And the Sandinistas acceded to that and said, yes, those were their goals and they would keep those four uh, 
provisions or promises. And they haven't. They, they never made an effort to keep them. They violated all of them. Now, this is what makes me say that, the, um, that there's a, a great hypocrisy there of the Sandinista government uh, protesting what is happening in its own country and from people who were once a part of its own revolution at the same time that they are supporting people in another country who are seeking to overthrow a duly elected government of the people. Mr. President, you, in referring to these groups, uh, you seem to suggest that, uh, that these groups are seeking uh, a change in Nicaragua itself. And how does that statement square with your saying that we're not violating the law in aiding groups who seek the overthrow of the Nicaraguan government? Well, do they or are they asking that government, or that revolution of which they themselves were a part, asking it to go back to its revolutionary promises and keep faith with the revolution that the people of Nicaragua supported? Many of these people are businessmen whose businesses have been taken over. They are farmers whose land was seized by this government, farmers whose crops were, uh, they were forced to sell them to the government at less than the cost of production. And uh, they're protesting uh, this violation of what had made them support the revolution to begin with. But the whole, uh, the whole purpose of the Sandinista government seems to be not only with El Salvador, but the export of revolution to, the, to their other neighbors, to countries that are already democracies. And Honduras has taken that step. Costa Rica is the oldest democracy of all. And all of them are plagued by radicals in their midst who are encouraged by the Sandinista government. Mr. President, I'd like to go back to what the committee actually did yesterday in voting the cutoff. CIA Director Casey is reported to have said it, it would lead to a, a, a bloodbath for the guerrillas inside the country. Do you agree with that? And how seriously do you take what the committee does? How bad would it be if uh, that cutoff of covert aid went through? Well, I'm saying if, well, if that became the policy, I think it would set a very dangerous precedent. Uh, the executive branch of government and the Congress has a shared responsibility, as I pointed out in my uh, speech, uh, for foreign policy. And uh, we have, we, we each have a, a place in formulating foreign policy, but we each have a, have a responsibility also. And I think that what I said about this was that it was very irresponsible. And it was, uh, uh, it literally was taking away the ability of the executive branch to, uh, to carry out its constitutional responsibilities. Do you believe that it would lead to the bloodbath that the CIA director talked about? Well, I haven't heard his entire remark and, uh, uh, in connection with that term or how he described it or what he meant with it. I'd, uh, I'll make it a point to find out. Uh, I once used a bloodbath term as governor of California, and uh, one individual reversed it in the press and had it saying uh, the opposite of what I had intended it to say, and I never did quite get the situation cleared up. Well, what, I don't understand. What's wrong with the committee's position? What, what difference does it make if, instead of giving covert aid to the guerrillas in Nicaragua, you give overt aid to the countries of El Salvador and Honduras to stop the flow of weapons through their countries, which is what you say you want in the first place. Well, What's except that, that then the only help that you can give is through other governments. And I don't think that, uh, I don't think that's an effective thing to do. And how do you know that the other governments uh, would want to themselves then participate uh, in uh, helping the people that need the help? In other words, we'd be asking some other government to do what our own, con what our congressional, or our Congress has said that we can't do. Let me ask you a broader foreign policy question that um, comes up with all this, some of these other negotiations. You've been in office now more than two years, more than half of the term for which you were elected, and the arms talks are going along with no clear end in sight. The Middle East situation, if anything, has gotten worse. That 
We're trying to get a, an agreement now to get the Israelis out of Lebanon, where a year ago they weren't, hadn't gone, even gone into Lebanon yet. And in our relations with China have deteriorated. We've had a lot of problems in Western Europe. What do you say to those critics who say that your foreign policy has been very unsuccessful so far and that it's produced nothing? Well, I say that that's a very distorted picture. And uh, I think that we've made great progress. Uh, Beirut is no longer being shelled on a daily basis, round the clock, 15 hours of bombardment in one day. Uh, yes, we're down to negotiating. Sure, there are incidents, but we're down to negotiating a withdrawal of foreign forces after eight years of combat and invasion and harassment from outside as well as inside in Lebanon. Um, with regard to Western Europe, I don't believe that the NATO alliance has ever been any more solid than it is now, or that there's been a better relationship between us and our NATO allies. Uh, the uh, same thing is true in, uh, in Asia, in Japan, uh, with the ASEAN nations. The, I could wish that we could move faster in some of these things. And when you say the arms talks, as I said before, it took seven years for the SALT talks. Uh, uh, Two years, four years ago, when the Carter administration was in its third year, they had completed the Camp David Agreement and the treaty from that. The SALT treaty was about to be negotiated. The um, oh, normalization with China had taken place, and the Panama Canal Treaty had been approved. So they had some tangible things which they had achieved. Can you name several besides the opening up of Beirut that you've achieved? Well, in the first place, China racial relations had been normalized uh, by the visits of a previous president to the previous administration. And uh, he carried on from there. And I'm not at all sure that uh, added anything to what had already been accomplished. Um, with regard to the Camp David agreements, yes, they started. And uh, we're proceeding within the framework of those agreements because those agreements were simply to begin negotiations. And it was after we got in that uh, the principal step between Egypt and Israel was carried out, uh, which was the return of the Sinai. And what we're actually doing now is trying to bring about the negotiations that had been proposed and apparently then accepted uh, which was to negotiate the West Bank and try to bring uh, uh, peace in the Middle East. But the, uh, uh, we are the ones who've gone a step beyond that with regard to trying to have an overall peace in the entire area. That had never been proposed. Mr. President, you said the other day that too much attention had been focused on bringing the PLO into the negotiations. I'm wondering, do you have a plan to proceed without the PLO if they decide not to uh, become a part of the process? Well, this would require, of course, the agreement of the other Arab states, of the Arab states. And since the negotiations we're trying to bring about are between the Arab states and Israel for peace in the region, uh, we have to recognize their position with regard to this. The It would take them agreeing to go forward in negotiations without the PLO. I must say that the contact we had with the heads of many Arab states after the uh, change in the supposed agreement between King Hussein and, and Arafat, when the council overrode Arafat and then demanded things that Hussein could not accept, that none of the others could accept. I talked to all of them and none of them uh, wanted to, wanted to uh, back the PLO in that new proposal. Uh, they, they felt about it the same as, as we did and the same as King Hussein did. Now uh, they continue in their talks uh, uh, with Arafat. And um, I have been told that Arafat himself did oppose the council on that change, but was overruled uh, by the council. Now the thing, uh, we must see is, uh, uh, do we let that council, which certainly was never elected uh, by the Palestinian people, and millions of Palestinians, and uh, uh, are they going to stand still for their interests being 
neglected uh, on the basis of an action taken by uh, this group, uh, the PLO, which as I say was never elected by the Palestinian people. Uh, this, these are some of the things that we're trying to work out. Would you like to see, uh, would you like to think of encouraging, uh, for instance, a referendum uh, among the Palestinians uh, to see whether uh, some other leadership or represent representation could be? If such a thing were practical and could be worked out, I don't know in the scattered nature of them. There are Palestinians in virtually every country in the Middle East. I don't know whether you could ever uh, get them together and bring about what, uh, or even do the, uh, the educating of them. I, that's, I don't mean that word to sound demeaning or degrading to them, but I mean the, the informing them uh, uh, so that they could uh, go in with some concept of what it was they were, uh, they were voting on. And uh, so I don't know, but I, I do know that the Arab nations are very serious about wanting the continuation of the peace talks. And that is an option that has been cons discussed, you've discussed with them is some kind of referendum. As to where, no, 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 I've never discussed that. But uh, we have been in, we're, we're in communication with them all the time about uh, how we proceed. And uh, as I say, I think that uh, uh, for a time there, and the way that was portrayed, to think that all of us could be blocked uh, by just this decision by that council uh, was giving them too much importance. Mr. President, uh, on another topic, once again, uh, there have been an another rash of stories about feuding among your uh, senior staff, some of the stories on, uh, relating to various issues that have uh, run into trouble in Congress have indicated this is not just a matter of internal rivalry, but it's affected strategy, has uh, caused you some setbacks and de defeat. Sometimes from some of your remarks about this in interviews, you seem like the only one in Washington who doesn't believe that some of uh, your top aides are at each other's throats. And some of us wonder, do you, when you read these stories, uh, do you call people in and ask them about it? Do you not believe them? Do you think they just should be dismissed out of hand? Uh, is it not a problem uh, in your administration? Well, I have to say that I think there's been great exaggeration. And I think to portray that uh, there are factions trying to uh, win over my mind, uh, probably, as I've said before, springs from the fact that the manner in which I asked the cabinet to operate, my administration to operate, uh, is one of that I want all options, and I want them debated in front of me. So it is true, and this is very upsetting and disturbing then, for someone to go out and leak some information that makes it look as if, well, there was a loser. Now, this bothers me from the standpoint that in cabinet, this could inhibit the process that I want. What we have is, uh, because most issues don't just concern one cabinet agency, they, they do spread across a lot. And so here you have this debate going. And yes, there will be disagreement, but finally on the basis of the information that has come out of the debate, I make a decision. Well, in that decision, there's gotta be some who are on the wrong side and some on the right side. But the very next cabinet meeting, it may change. Uh, and so far, it hasn't inhibited them. But when you pick up the paper and then read, well, Secretary so-and-so was a loser in this, he was opposed to this, and then it makes it sound like this is all some kind of feuding. Uh, it isn't. It's what I have asked for. But and, uh, well, President, why, why do you stay, the impression is that you stay aloof from the fray when, when there is criticism following up on Carl's question that your foreign policy conduct is being affected by the continual criticism from this building of Judge Clark and now on Capitol Hill too. Uh, why do you well, not get involved in that? That is, uh, I am, and I am, uh, believe me, trying to find out who is, uh, uh, who is carrying this out. When we sit in here in a briefing on foreign policy, we're all in here together, uh, all the top staff, and everyone has a chance to speak up with whether they agree or disagree. And uh, the same is true on domestic policy. 
when we sit in here and there's room to discuss domestic policy as well as when we do it in the cabinet meetings. And uh, yes, I am very upset by whoever's carrying these tales. How are you trying to find out what? Well, the, that, uh, I can't give you specifics, but just let me say that I am, uh, I'm dealing with this. Are, are you satisfied with the way the staff is, is working now, or do you intend to make some changes? No, I'm satisfied because we, uh, it is working. Are you telling us, for instance, that uh, you do not believe uh, the theme of uh, persistent stories in specific, such as that there is a great deal of serious friction between uh, Judge Clark and Jim Baker. Are you saying that that's, not, uh, that's an exaggeration and not an accurate portrayal? Yes, I am. And I think what happens sometimes is people that'll, at a different level uh, go out with stories because they think that they're speaking in behalf of uh, uh, their side of the fence or uh, their superior. And uh, they're causing a lot of needless trouble. Mr. President, may I ask uh, another question about Central America? Yeah. Uh, many uh, members of the administration say that uh, our commitment there must be, a, in El Salvador, must be a sustained one and that it could take seven to ten years uh, to uh, turn things around. I think Ambassador Hinton uh, suggested as much recently. Is that your view? Well, I think that he, I may be wrong, but I, I think that when he made that statement, he was talking with regard to uh, the limited uh, way that we have been uh, trying to perform there. I know that guerrilla wars, uh, time is on the side of the guerrillas, and they, uh, they aren't something that is instantly resolved. Uh, just as terrorism isn't something that can be curbed just by uh, normal police actions. These are very difficult things. The hit and run tactics of guerrillas are similar to terrorist activities. Uh, it's, I suppose, based on an extension of the same principle that you can't ever totally eliminate crime. Um, but do you think if, the, if this aid package were approved by Congress, that it would be sufficient to turn things around there this year? Your own proposal calls for less aid next year, and it seems to suggest that this surge of aid would do the trick. Well, the surge we're asking for right now is a restoration of what we asked for in the first place. Um, and as I say, it was, it's better than two to one uh, economic aid. The problem with a country like El Salvador and what its problems are right now that requires military aid in the sense of more training, so far only having trained a tenth of the, of the army, more training that we could offer, uh, more military supplies and ammunition and so forth, we must do is when, when you've got a government that is trying to reverse the course, the history of, a, of the country and bring about uh, democracy and human rights and the things of that kind. And you have guerrillas that are making it impossible uh, to, to function or for those programs to function. What good does it do to have um, a land reform program and give land to the peasants if the peasants can't go out and work the land for fear of being shot by the guerrillas? What good does it do to try and improve the economic standards of a people if they're out of work simply because someone has shut off the power and the factory can't operate? Or transportation is broken down so that the supplies that are needed uh, and the products from whatever they're working on cannot uh, be transported because of the, the bridges and so forth that are blown up. Uh, when a third of uh, one area of the country, a third of the year, they were totally without power. Well, then you have to say, if we're going to make this economic improvement work, we've got to stop that conflict. We have to stop those people that are preventing the economy from moving um, with their firearms and their murders and so forth. And um, this is what it seems that uh, 
sometimes in the debate in the Congress, uh, they seem to be ignoring. Mr. President, can I follow up on something you said earlier? Did I understand you to say that if you were forced to stop aid to the uh, uh, Nicaraguan guerrillas, that you would try to funnel it through other countries? No, this is what, no, I was saying that's what they, what the committee said, that the committee said we would have to go over it. And then in going over it, you can only give money uh, to another government. And if you did that, then you would have to be depending on, well, maybe those other governments in Central America would give that money uh, to the freedom fighters in, in Nicaragua. Uh, now, if they want to tell us that we can give money to, and do the same things we've been doing, money, giving, providing uh, subsistence and so forth to these people uh, directly and making it overt instead of covert, that's all right with